Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for a really exciting discussion on how to do influencer marketing right during COVID-19. We have chosen this topic based on your feedback, and we'll be running a poll at the end of the webinar to help us choose the topic for our next one. We'll also be running a short Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to send us any questions in the Q&A session in, on the Zoom interface, and we'll try to answer as many as possible and if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email us at ask at bookbusiness.com. As a final introductory note, if you haven't done so already, I would highly encourage you to subscribe to our Vogue Business newsletters to receive our latest coverage and insights on topics including sustainability, technology, and influencer marketing. My name is Gregory Ostola, and I lead the Insights and Advisory function at Vogue Business, and I will be moderating the webinar today. And I'm very excited to welcome our retail and marketing editor, Katie Tritricorn. Thank you for having me, Greg. It is a pleasure to join you, and hello to everyone else as well. It's really great to have you join our session today. And leading influencer agent, Jennifer Powell. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Powell and I am the CEO and founder of Jennifer Powell Inc. Thank you both for taking the time to share your insights with us today. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Katie to lead us through today's topic. Thank you, Greg. So the influencer marketing industry has been maturing over the past few years and we've seen brands constantly evolve their strategies to resonate with audience and drive sales. But the direction of the market is now changing due to COVID-19. So the topics we'll be covering today are one, the extent to which COVID-19 has impacted influencer marketing, two, the challenges that influencers and brands are facing, and three, the opportunities for brands to work without traditional influencers and other solutions that can be explored. So these are important topics to be discussing now because we've been seeing change happen across the industry, particularly in marketing and PR. We've seen plenty of coverage recently on the impact of COVID-19 on staff and budget cuts. So this month, Vogue Business ran an exclusive survey across 61 fashion industry professionals working in HR. Greg, would you like to explain some more? Absolutely, Katie. So as, as Katie mentioned, there has pl been plenty of media coverage around companies uh, cutting budgets. And from a high level, our survey response is in line with that. And in particular, 78% of our respondents said that they were either um, considering hiring freezes or hiring fewer um, staff, with 67% specifying hiring freezes. The reason why that becomes relevant to today's topic is that interestingly, influencers sit between departments that are at the two poles in this chart, um, Marcom and PR in the far, on the far left and digital on the far right. Um, so Marcom's in particular being the department that is most likely um, to be affected by hiring freezes or potential budget cuts. And digital, that seems to be the department that is somewhat shielded um, or shielded the most from a pandemic and therefore whose budgets are less likely to be impacted. Right, and that's why influencer marketing is such an interesting topic right now. So shy of even like a decade ago, there are a few opportunities for influencers or like back then they were known as bloggers to monetize. And today they're able to make money through paid assignments like event appearances, product promotions, sponsored trips, and other activities the brands that they work with. So, I mean, while the virus is first and foremost a, a health crisis, it's also brought many of their plans to a halt. According to a recent e-consultancy survey, 55% of UK marketers and 57% of marketers in the US are now delaying product and service launches. And a majority of them have also said that their marketing budgets are under review. So now I thought it would be a good time to bring you in, Jennifer. Like, can you tell us a bit about the clients that you work with? What kind of projects do they normally work on and what challenges or changes have they seen recently? Of course. So I represent some macro fashion influencers. It's Danielle Bernstein from We Were What, Jules from Sincerely Jules, uh, Mary Lawless Lee from Happily Gray, and several others. Um, we do sponsored posts. We shoot campaigns as a uh, face of campaigns. We do, you know, event attendance and <clears throat> a lot of co-branded product we create with brands. Um, on a, on a large, on a macro level, but also we, we still do the, the sponsored postings where they're shooting, where they're shooting product on a day to day. Mm -hmm. um, 
we've seen like a myriad of articles around like the death of the influencer marketing industry circulating even before the pandemic and COVID-19 has only made things all the more challenging. Like what, what changes have you seen in their schedule? Well, obviously a lot of our big branded moments have gone away and uh, there's also a lot of branded campaigns that are put on pause. I think that um, it obviously is impactful for our bottom line and the businesses, uh, the, the bottom line of their own individual businesses. And our challenges are very much like the brands. It's about figuring out what is appropriate in terms of tone and how to create a thoughtful, responsible content during this time. Um, and obviously like, there's been conversation about affiliate programs put on hold, which has impacted them as well. Though it's just one revenue stream of quite a few that has been, um, that's been also been put on pause. It's just like much of, Every, what everybody else is feeling. I think these are pauses. It's a moment in time, but it's absolutely not the end of influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. So like you, you did mention that some retailers have been pausing their affiliate marketing programs and just more broadly, consumer behavior has been shifting during COVID-19 and many people are rethinking trivial processes both in and out of fashion. I think a lot of people are wondering how can influencers and brands remain relevant without seeming out of touch or insensitive? I think it's imperative for brands and influencers um, <clears throat> to acknowledge what's going on in our world right now. I think that it's, it's about pivoting from selling product and we've had a lot of success with creating community and supporting their communities through this, um, through this time. We do a lot of uh, crowdsourcing to try to figure out where their followers are, followers are and what they need throughout this time as well. And we work together with the brands that we're working with to be able to share with them what that feedback is and then try to discuss how best to create together. Mm -hmm. And does this vary by type of influencers? I think before the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about like, micro-influencers and nano-influencers. We look at macro-influencers versus someone like micro-influencers. Is one group more effective than the other during this time? Well, I, it seems to me that brands are putting their existing marketing budgets, whatever they have, on, on macro-influencers that are able to convert, that are proven, thoughtful, creating thoughtful um, content during this time. I haven't seen so many micro uh, campaigns running re uh, recently. Um, and I think that the people that are proving conversion right now have been absolutely uh, important. And the ones that aren't pushing so much product but be able to convert through, um, through just thoughtful content. Mm -hmm. So in a story for book business, I wrote about how companies have been experimenting with different approaches like remote shooting. Um, some brands have tapped to influencers to show how they're wearing clothing from home. Um, other brands I've spoken to have been using content that they've been like stockpiling from trips they happened to do earlier this year, hoping it will carry them through spring and summer. Um, Jennifer, like what other approaches have you observed? And also like what options are there for brands who can't necessarily invest heavily into advertising? Well, I've seen a couple of the brands do a great job. I mean, Revolve is doing great with their Revolve shopping network. It's like the home shopping network with designers and influencers talking through collections over Instagram lives. I thought that that was really creative and fun and engaging. I have influencers like Sincerely Jewels, who's shooting full campaigns, um, including product shots for e-commerce at home, which is made easier by the fact that she's quarantined with her husband, who is a photographer for sure. Um, the talent has done many different in engaging moments, happy hours over Instagram Live, Zoom, and uh, Instagram Live and Zoom, and hosting book clubs and cooking classes and workouts and dance challenges and TikTok challenges and um, in different ways to engage their audience, but still have branded product and still be. Um, doing a level of advertising. Um, I also represent Cameron James Wilson, who's the creator of the first CGI supermodel, Shudu. Um, and we've been creating a lot of marketing assets with avatars. So there is actually no human contact necessary and all can be done with 3D clothing files. So that's been really interesting to see the interest that brands are having 
in, in avatars and what the potential is there to create. Absolutely. And I would love to come back to um, digital models and avatars. But I also thought it was interesting what you said about people kind of pivoting to dance and TikTok. And that's yeah. something I've covered on as well, how influencers were expanding their offering. They're expanding into new formats like Instagram Live, TikTok. But still, a lot of people still say that authenticity has to be at the core of these collaborations. Do you have suggestions to how brands and influencers kind of post content outside of their usual wheelhouse without coming across as inauthentic? I think that to, I think it's very difficult to come out of your wheelhouse and to do and to try to talk to things that you're not familiar with. I think that there has to be a narrative that is brought back that is familiar. Um, I think that, like I said before, we've been doing a lot of crowdsourcing to see to take the temperature of our audience. I think that it's absolutely imperative, first and foremost, when we're dealing with um, things that are unfamiliar to absolutely figure out and identify who that influencer is that you're working with and make sure that fit is authentic first. And also then to bring them in in the collaborative process and try to figure out how to create the content together collaboratively. I think that it's uncharted territories in a lot of ways. And um, but I think that there's an opportunity to create in deeper relationships between brand and influencer right now and to really understand that they that there is an opportunity to tell new stories together. But I think that the thing that I've seen work super well is that the brand has to really connect with the influencer in terms of what is working right now and understand that what's right for them on their channel might not be right for the influencer and try to come together on that. I think that that's really integral into creating success right now. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And also like Shudi, which you mentioned earlier, who is a CGI model, like she, um, she is one of the world's first digital supermodels. Like for people who are not so familiar with this, like what opportunity is there for virtually created models? And do they cost more or less than regular influencers? Well, I think as the brands right now are exploring more digital options and how to run their businesses, that um, and as more brands explore to in, implement 3D design and technology, um, the more we'll see them be able to experiment with CGI models. Um, we could create marketing assets without needing to have people in the same room or even on the same continent. Um, Cameron James Wilson, and there's is the creator of her, but he also has a team behind him that's creating these assets um, on a day to day, say day to day from Weymouth, UK. They they cost the co the cost is comparable to a traditional model um, or a traditional influencer. Uh, and but if we're creating a new avatar, bespoke avatar for a brand, then that of course is a bit more expensive because of the legwork to create that. Um, but I also think that people have to identify why they would be working with an avatar. I think mm -hmm. that there is, uh, the way we see her is that she is art and we're creating art with designers, makeup artists, photographers, brands, and truly it, it's a collaborative experience. So there's a PR aspect of, of cre do, working with digital avatars. Um, but there's also a real solution that we're, we're able to use her with. We're able to create digital campaigns. We're able to uh, create solutions for people that are wanting to shoot e-commerce and not having opportunity to shoot models in studio right now. So there really is solutions that we're finding um, to be able to, and way, different new ways of using avatars. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are the key things that brands need to know if they want to explore this option of, you know, digital models, digital clothing? Well, we need to understand if they have digital files, like di digital design files of the actual clothing or um, whatever the, whatever we, the product is that we're shooting. And then we have to, basically, it's just talking through what we need and like timeline and things like that. It's very much like shooting with an influencer and really being collaborative, understanding what the campaign is supposed to look like and 
being able to work on a day to day on making that like hitting those notes um, and creating what they're looking to do. It's Cameron was a fashion photographer, so it's very easy to have these com fashion conversations with him and for him to understand um, the sort of imagery that's important in connecting for a marketing campaign. It's also fascinating. And I think the good news that comes out of this is that recessions are often a breeding ground for innovation and more positive shifts. Okay. I mean, the, the search volume for influencer marketing on Google has hit an all time high. So clearly there's still a lot of interest in this area. So I thought to conclude our conversation, like perhaps we could look back to the beginning of the year, like how has COVID-19 changed things? And what do you think will be the lasting impacts of the pandemic on influencer culture? You know, I think of it, it's funny thinking of it now, it seems so excessive. It's excess, it's excess travel, um, nonstop business transactions, nonstop Mo like just money and transactional really it feels looking back it feels like another life it feels very transactional um without a minute to slow down or catch breaths or figure out why we're doing this still um i think that there's been a welcome shakeup in influencer marketing i think that there is a natural reset of intention reminding us of our need to uh, to connect with each other and what their responsibility is in that um, and not just to sell things to one another. I think that the brands will have more meaningful requirements with who is considered an effective influencer for their brands, um, who they create the relationships with, which influencers they create the relationships with and therefore where they want to invest their marketing dollars. I think there's just going to be an overall um, reassessment of who we want to align our brands with. Um, I think it's, it, for influencer marketing, it's a survival of the fittest moment. I think that some will rise and some will fall away, but I don't actually think that that's a bad thing. I think that, um, I think it might've been necessary for us. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I think also the other good news is that many influencers who I've spoken with, they've all reported an uptick on engagement and views on their social media posts. So again, it goes to show there is interest, yeah. but there's also concern I found that despite this, influencers' revenue stream could continue to drop in some way. Um, so during the last recession, the average cost of a sponsored post fell by 62.7% between 2008 and 2010. Um, this data was from influencer marketing firm Isaiah. So what we're seeing is an increase in media consumption, but a decrease in some, from some companies in advertising spend. And I think a lot of people are wondering where the money is going. Um, what are your clients thinking as the situation evolves? Well, my guess is the money is going to help the businesses survive. And we understand that too, because we're doing the same thing. I think they're all small businesses. When you think of influencers, they, most of them do. Um, the ones that I handle have employees and we have our own owned and operated brands. And so there's that survival mode that we're all in. But we're also trying to figure out other ways of supporting our communities and being effective with the brands that we work with where um, we have, there's like a newfound social responsibility that I think a lot of them are having and understanding that they're becoming a hub of um, resources, inspiration, entertainment, all of those things. I think some of them have really doubled down into charitable aspect, like being able to support charitably giving back. Um, making that part of our brand deals is that there must be some sort of a give back um, offering. I think that um, we are, we're just realizing those things. And, and I think this time is to create goodwill too. I think that it's really important for the influencers, for the brands to be creating goodwill and it not being all about selling. I mean, it is scary, don't get me wrong. And we're concerned for their businesses, but at the same time, I think we're all in the same boat. Everybody's worried and trying to figure out what's gonna happen next and we might as well be doing good in the interim time. So to be able to figure out how to give back and how to be help with resources. And I've really seen it with Danielle Bernstein and we were what she's become a, a hub of information for people like that are looking for small business support, for job opportunities for, um, and she's become a connector. And 
that is something that I don't know that I fully realize that social media can do. It's the great connector that we have to one another and we're able to, um, to provide that for, for people, for individuals, for brands. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for influencers that have, are putting out really thoughtful, meaningful content and are understanding how important it could be during this time. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So to quickly summarize our conversation, we've discussed one, influencers can help brands deliver high quality content during these uncertain times because word of mouth is still key. However, building a community should be a focus over selling products. Two, thanks to new technology, brands can explore options like remote shooting or virtually created clothes or model, models. And three, most importantly, a relationship between a brand and influencer should be more of a collaboration than a transactional one. So thank you everyone who joined us today. Um, we'll now move on to Q&As. Uh, thank you, Katie and Jennifer. That was really interesting discussion. Um, so let's open up to questions from the audience. So I'm gonna start off with the first one that we've received that was, do you feel that influencers will have to demonstrate additional professional skills like photography, makeup, or coding in order to enhance narratives um, as for, a brand, for, for a brand from now on? Well, what I'm seeing now is it's helpful if influencers have other ways of engaging with the brand. There are just more marketing opportunities and more storytelling opportunities and ways to engage with an audience. But I don't think that influencers should be honing skills that they're not proficient in. I have a girl named Tessa, Tessa Barton. She's an American influencer, but she also went to school for photography and fine art, and she is now using time to teach tips and tricks of photography. And I think that that's been a really interesting narrative for her to be able to give to her audience and ways to engage and bring brands alongside that. I think that makes absolute sense. Like brands will get the most out of partnerships with influencers who offer a broader skill set because a successful influencer, as you said earlier, is a successful guide, but it has to be authentic. And the examples I'm seeing as well are like the Postnet twins, they're photographers at heart, but they also work with brands like Manzio Gabriel and Castle mm. or the Halpern girls. Um, they're really interested in craft and slow fashion. And you see them aligning themselves with brands like Margaret Howell and Sunspell. So to move on to another question, one, one was around how can micro influencers keep their jobs during COVID-19? And as a follow up, I would say, um, would attempting to start um, be, becoming an influencer in this climate being, is, is it realistic or achievable? I, I think that being an influencer, it's, I think you need to right now just focus your time on figuring out what your passion is. I don't, I, it's hard for me to understand being an influencer as a job. And I think that really people that have been really successful, the ones that I have worked with are ones that really have created, their businesses have come out of something that they love. They were super passionate about shooting beautiful content or telling certain kinds of stories. And that's where we've seen the greatest success, not going into it like it's starting a business, but going into it because you're passionate about it and you're finding ways of connecting and you're being creative. And so I think this time is really important to try to figure out what that is and not focus so much on selling or being a quote unquote influencer, but really figuring out what you could provide to a, an audience in terms of entertainment or resource or help or whatever it may be. But I think that that's a better use of time. It's like repositioning that what, what it is that you want to do in, in a more authentic way. So on that one, do you think, as a, as a follow-up, do you think that unpacking is a trend that has ended? What is it? Unpacking. Unpacking? unpacking. Oh, you mean like, like hauls, like op unboxing? I don't think so. I think that everybody's curious about a lot of, like what these, I mean, I still have girls doing hauls and it's still being effective. I think that it, it has to have a lighter touch. I think it can't be so obvious. I don't think it's over. I think people are curious about what people are receiving or even like in, in your house, what you have going on in your house. I think that there's, there's, I think there's interest. I think there's interest in each other. I think that there's a, a natural need to connect right now. So sharing, I see it as sharing versus being, like two branded un unboxing. I think there has to be a, uh, a lighter touch, but I still think that there's a curiosity 
like what people are doing, what people are eating, what they're using on their skin. Like, I mean, what, there's a lot of time on our hands in a lot of ways. Um, so another question that we received was, um, what are your thoughts on brands using full-time corporate employees as influencers to create content for brands? You know, I think that right now there it's an, a solution to shooting product. I think that editors have turned into this in a, in a this happened to a lot of the editors um, in fashion magazines. I think that they're natural ambassadors for a brand. I don't think it's a bad thing if they're comfortable with it. I think that ultimately if we're, if you have social media, like you're influencing people in some level. So I think, I think it's a natural, if they're comfortable with it and if that seems like the right brand narrative, I love the idea of raising everybody and making them all feel like they're part of a brand story. I think that it could be, it could be really effective in having people understand your brand, who you have working for you. I actually think that it could be a really successful strategy. Me too. I really like that someone said in that question, that's something that I've seen as well at a time when there's, you know, the lack of usual influences and models, maybe kind of some brands, I think I've seen up by Marc Jacobs, I've seen Moschino do it. They're taking a bit of the American apparel playbook and they're mm -hmm. using their own employees who know the product well, it gives them a more participatory role, role which is yeah. a nice thing. And it's also in a way selling the idea of aspirational realness, which I've written about before in my stories that Glossier tries to sell it. This is very real, this is very human, and they're part yeah. of it. So just switching slightly towards a question we've um, slightly touched upon with virtual and 3D. We have one, since brands are looking at virtual and 3D influence right now, are there enough technologically savvy agencies out there to help brands with this new need? I don't think that there's many. I think that a lot of, I, I mean, we're all finding our way through. It feels very much like when I started influencers 12 years ago, I think that there's a few of us or maybe a handful that are finding our way through it. But I also think that you can find them online and you can talk to these people directly as well. Um, and they're artists. And so I think that there's some very, um, it's, it's new, it's, it's young. There's not that many of us. I, I think I might be one of two or three. Um, but I think that the artists directly are people that you could talk to about creating together. And, um, and I think we'll see more as time goes on and potentially even like models, actors, you know, having their own avatars and there being a sustainable aspect of this. And so people don't have to do the travel that they've been doing and, um, and lowering their, the uh, carbon footprint. So I think that we'll be seeing more. And, um, but for now, there's a handful. Thank, thank you very much for, for all the answers, um, Jennifer and Katie. Um, unfortunately, because of time, we'll have to bring this uh, webinar to a close. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, it was a really insightful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for having us. And everyone else, if you have any further questions, you can find us online at Vogue Business. Yeah. So we hope you have enjoyed the insights from, that we shared today. And I'm now going to launch a poll um, that I mentioned at the start of the webinar on what topic you would like us to cover in our next webinar. So as you fill the poll out, um, I'd, like you, I'd like to remind you that um, to subscribe to our newsletter uh, for our latest insights by visiting our site, vogbusiness.com. And if you have any specific questions around any, our advisory, any other questions that come up relating to this webinar or any other topic, I would highly encourage you to get in touch with us at the email ask at vogbusiness.com. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining. Stay safe and have a great weekend.